Check. Check. Check, 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 check. Check. A little echoey. Check. to start anyway, Rilla. Awesome. Good. Good morning. We're slowly starting to fill up again. That's so nice. It's wonderful. We're so glad that you're here and uh, we welcome you to a time of worship and of just being with each other again. And uh, I see everyone slowly getting haircuts. That's so much fun. Uh, and uh, We've got a week of rain, so I don't know what your plans were going to be for this week. I see some heads knocking. It's like, what, what did you say, Bernice? What was your saying about the wheat? When it's raining, it's wheat time. Something about rain coming at the wrong time for the wheat harvest. So, yeah, that is, uh, that's not good timing for that. Anyways, Welcome. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, as you know, we, we try to get 175 acts of kindness for our 175th anniversary. Uh, I still had them coming in, and uh, we are way, 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 way over. And so good on all of you. And of course, we just want to acknowledge that a lot of those acts of kindness are things that we do in our everyday lives anyway. And it's just good sometimes to kind of go, wow, look at the way the Lord is working through us. This, as we say, a little church making a big difference. So that's just been a lot of fun. Spread the news, July 24th is our 175th uh, open house from 1 till 3 p.m. And looking at uh, how lockdowns are lifting, we anticipate that we'll be able to park and walk through. And so we're we're really thankful for that. 
We're also creating a family directory, a pictorial directory with addresses. That'll be for our congregation only. And so we just ask that you find some way to get a picture of yourself and submit that for the directory. And then that'll come out later on in the fall. Marie is asking if anyone has photographs, uh, particularly from the 60s moving forward for the drive through at the anniversary, if, if you could share those with Marie so that uh, that can be part of our drive through um, Last week we talked about taking, well, we called it a walkabout with God one day. There's uh, at the front a couple of uh, little brochures or guides to help you spend a day with the Lord, and so we encourage you to just um, make use of, of those or your own Bibles and spend a day in prayer and talking with Jesus. We acknowledge the passing of Bob Herndon, um, who is a, a, mem a Car Luke community member, and so we want to remember his family this week in his passing, and uh, also to let you know that Vivian McBay will be moving to the Meadows later on this week, and we're so thankful that there was a space opened for her and so perhaps at some point over the next month, you might want to just encourage her. It's always hard to move, and uh, a little note might just encourage her. Any other announcements? All right. Our call to worship from the Psalms. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord, my soul. Blessed are those whose help comes from the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord, my soul. Let's come to our God in prayer. Gentle shepherd, King of love, we come to you as we are, not as we pretend to be. We lay ourselves wide open this morning, Jesus, that you might see our brokenness, that we present to you our vulnerability and our shame. The truth is, God, that, that when we step back and we kind of overlook our lives, we often discover how we are lost in a maze of choices and how often we don't bring you into them to guide us. We confess that we are lost, and if it weren't for you, for your grace, for you, seeker of our souls, the patient parent, we would continue to be lost. But because of you, there is room for us at the banquet table. Gentle shepherd, king of love, seek and find us as we are, not as we pretend to be. Be patient with us. Teach us how we might follow you with our whole heart, mind, and soul. May your love transform our worship from a mournful plea to joyful song as in our confession we receive your grace, your forgiveness. Gentle shepherd, king of love, lead us. O Christ, you who was crucified and now risen from the dead, O spirit who comforts and empowers, O great one, three, holy trinity, Set us free this hour to worship you. Amen. We begin by opening our hearts in thanksgiving to God for his grace. Let's sing praise to the Lord.
in what is normally our choir time and our offering time, I, I thought I would just present to you um, just some thoughts about giving. And so I wonder if you know who the greatest financial, financial advisor in the Bible was. Anyone? No? Um, Noah. He was floating his stock while everyone else was in liquidation. I thought that was a good one. Yeah. I actually came up with a good one. Usually you just go, oh man, Nance. Who was the greatest female financial advisor? Any clue? Pharaoh's daughter. She went down to the bank of the Nile and drew out a little profit. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> I invite Marie up to read our scripture this morning from Genesis 28. Anna, can you turn on the pulpit mic, please? Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and watch, will watch over you whenever you go, wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to call it Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food and eat food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I sometimes think of Jacob's story a little bit as a confusing one. We know Jacob is one of the patriarchs who receives this promise of great blessing and that all nations will come from his forefathers and him. But I often wonder, why did God choose Jacob? If we read the story beforehand, Jacob is known as a deceiving schemer. From the time he was born, he grabbed onto his twin's heel and, and was born almost at the same time as if to say, no, 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 I, I want to be the firstborn. And then he cheats his twin out of his birthright, and he cheats him out of his blessing. He's, he's always conniving. And here in this story, just prior, and Jacob is fleeing for his life because their father Isaac has just died, and basically Esau has said, now that daddy's gone, you're next. And he puts a bounty on his head, so to speak. And so Jacob runs. You see, I, I get that God chose Noah because he was known for his righteousness. 
I get that God called Abraham. He was known for his faith. But Jacob, here he is running for his life because of the consequences that he himself created. He angered his brother by cheating him out of most of his life. And he's gotten the blessing. He's been promised the inheritance and, and now fleeing for his life. He's got to leave that all behind to protect himself. So far, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of redeeming qualities in Jacob. Nothing so far really has indicated that he's following the Lord or that he walks with him as his father Isaac did. So here on our text, while Jacob is running, the sun sets on his ambitions. And exhausted and defeated, he picks up a, or finds a rock and he uses it as a foundation for his head. Stones in his soul, so to speak. He's sleeping on the hard bed that he himself had made. And so we understand why God came to Noah or to Abraham. But it is overwhelming grace that we see when God comes to Jacob in his sleep in a dream. And what's so amazing about this dream is, is earlier in Scripture we often read that when angels come, it was the angels who would give the message. But here, the angels are going up and down, opening the gates of heaven, and it is the Lord himself who stands at the bottom of the ladder and speaks to Jacob. And what does the Lord say? He says, Jacob... I'm going to give you these unconditional promises. This is what's going to happen. I am the God of Abram and Isaac. And I will give you this land just like I promised your dads. I will bless your children and the whole world's going to be blessed through you. I am with you and I will not leave you. Incredible promise. Jacob's heart is melted by the presence of the Lord. He's, he's fearful. And, and for the first time, maybe he sees that the God of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham is his God. A God who has now set a new direction for Jacob's life. You, you don't have to scheme. I'm going to give it to you. The Lord gives Jacob this providential promise of a future nature nation that will bless the earth and a people who will be the inheritance of God. We're not talking just a small inheritance from daddy. We're talking land from the Lord. And upon wakening, Jacob immediately transforms this rocky pillow of his stony soul and he, he builds it into a pillar to worship, and he declares, God is here. This is Bethel. This is God's house. Jacob will now journey with the Lord as his Lord, having been fearfully transformed by God's presence, but there remains a problem. And I don't know if you recognize that in the scripture. See, he his response is a bargaining with God. It's just his old nature. It's what he does. And so he says, wow, God, this is, this is exciting. I, I like these promises. And then what does he say? If you will go with me. If you will give me everything that I need for this journey. If you let me return home, then you will be my God. Then I'll give you a tenth of my wealth. What was he thinking? Well, if God gives me a, the wife that I'm looking for, where my mother has sent me and I'm journeying to now, and, and if my, my God, this God, brings me back to the land of my parents where, where I know I have an inheritance, well then, you know, I'll give him a tenth of daddy's money. Is that what he's thinking? 
Jacob doesn't recognize that God has given him a providential, unconditional promises, and yet his old scheming nature comes through. Bargaining with God to bless his plans, his ideas. So Jacob's transformation, his faith walk, has a long ways to go, but he has begun the journey. I think Jacob's story is often our own story. We may have been raised to know the God of our parents. We may have been baptized as a covenant child. We may have even been able to name the moment when we realized without doubt that God entered our life. But at some point like Jacob, the God of our parents, the God of the different promises, needs also to become our God where we respond personally to his presence in our life, to claim Christ not as just the Lord of our parents, but the Lord of our lives. And that response and call for growth and change comes from God in the midst of how we are behaving and invites us to follow him. Not because he's always accepting of our behavior, but because he loves us in spite of it. And then calls us to follow him in faith, in obedience, in trust, in surrender to his will. To be transformed, to transform those stones in our soul into pillars of praise to God with our whole life. You see, our, our challenge, once we have met the very presence of the Lord, is not to remain stubborn and prideful. To not let our face stagnate and go, yeah, I've met the Lord, it was good. Now if. Jacob realizes the dream was a face-to-face -face encounter with the God of his fathers. And, and he realizes that this hard pillow that he's sleeping on needs change. And so he worships God. And although Jacob's response is left of center, he does choose the Lord to be his God. Because he's met him face to face. And, and, and maybe because that happened, there's a part of Jacob that goes, wow, I, God knows me. He knows what I've done. So the God of Abram and Isaac has now become, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It blows my mind also that God didn't come to Jacob and say, Hey, Jacob, I've been watching you. You've, you've really messed up and I'm done with you. You've broken the law and now you're going to pay. Dear friends, we mustn't continue believing the lie that says, I've done something so terrible that God allows bad things to happen because of what I've done. That God is getting even with me. You see, the grace of God is not that fickle. The Lord providentially ensures his greater redemptive plan stays on track. It is his providential grace, irrespective of human stubborn obedience, that God continues to call us to participate with him in the larger salvation plan. And while building the nation of Israel, Jacob the individual is pressed under God's sovereignty into situations, not as punishment, but as consequence of his own doing, but God allows that to happen because he uses it as a grace to transform Jacob and call him out of his old way of life. In the midst of overreaching redemption of the nation, God transforms individuals like you and I. And later, Jacob comes to his uncle Laban. We read that in the next chapters that come in Genesis. And there Jacob endures a lot of harsh consequences. In fact, his deceptive nature um, seems to be a family trait. 
as his uncle Laban deceives him to marry his oldest daughter when Jacob asked to marry the younger daughter. And Laban cheats Jacob out of his wages. And in a sense, Jacob is enslaved to Laban by having to commit to work seven years for the first wife, seven years for the second wife. It's, it's like forced labor in a sense. And through this hardship, Jacob slowly begins to lean on the Lord. And we start to see for the first time that Jacob calls on the name of the Lord. All of this is the kindness and the patience of God, which we need to recognize in our own lives, especially when we meet hardships. Sometimes the consequences of our own sinful choices or the sinful choices of others that get put on us, they lead us to repentance and grace because we see how much we need God. And the consequences we suffer, again, are, are not under the law in which if you do this bad thing, you deserve bad things. Or if someone does bad things to us, well, they deserve bad things. But rather that the hard things of this world are often the grace of God calling each and every one of us to deeper surrender. So what of your journey? Might you still be bargaining, reasoning that if God will fix this problem or that issue in your life, if he will heal or if he will prove himself, then you will follow? Then you will give him a tenth of your time, of your finances or whatever? Then you will believe and surrender and allow him to work in your life? Well, might we hear today as Jacob did? The assurance of the God who says, you don't need to orchestrate your life or make things happen because I already have given you a promise. I am your God. I have a providential plan. I will provide for you. I am with you. I will not leave you. Fall under my grace. Be called into my kindness. Allow me to transform you Might we allow this kindness of God who sent Christ to transform the stole, stones in our souls to become pillars of worship, strengthening us in faith and surrender to the Lord. We hear those promises from God throughout Scripture in many places, and particularly in Romans 8. And I've just taken a couple of verses the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray, for the Spirit himself intercedes through wordless groans. And a verse out of the message, which I think puts it very plainly, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as of his Son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape for our lives there in Christ. And after God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling his children by name. And he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had done and returning to the NIV with that verse that we all know and love, People of God, be convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, your promises go with us wherever we are. 
And, and we've come to this place of worship because we know that you have done things in our life that have rocked our boats, that have changed us, and that have called us to surrender to you. And we know, Lord, sometimes we get content. Yeah, I've met the Lord. Yeah, he's great. And then our human nature comes out, the, the struggles that we face in life where we forget to call on you. And, and sometimes, Lord, we know we bargain with you. And so we thank you for your word that reminds us that you are patient when we travel the wrong path. That you are loving and kind when, when others have harmed us and caused great conflict in our lives. We pray, Lord, that we may grow in the confidence and the assurance of your promises that you are with us and that you never leave us. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And so we surrender more of ourselves this morning and invite your spirit to enter in and lead us toward greater discipleship. And Jesus, as we come to you, we know that we can ask for anything in your name. And you know those things that are on our hearts. You know those struggles that we have. You know the tension in relationships. You know the grieving that continues. You know the physical pain that we suffer. You know the anxiety that comes into our lives. You know all of these things. For each one of us, Lord, we just, we just lift up whatever our struggles are, wherever we need to invite your assurance in, and we trust, Holy Spirit, that you would heal, that you would bless, and that you would come mightily with your presence. Jesus, we... We pray especially for the Herndon family as they grieve the loss of Bob. Would you surround them with your comfort? Would you lift them up with your strength? And would you fill them with the peace of Christ? We pray that you would be with Vivian as she makes a move this week. Would you grant her peace also? We pray that she may find great blessing in her new home and the care that she needs. We continue to pray for those who are journeying through health issues, who continue treatments, who are on the other side of treatments that long for your presence and hold fast to your healing in their lives. Father, we pray for this world and, and we see lockdowns opening up and, and we get excited and yet we know that in Canada maybe we're much further ahead than poorer countries in which medical help isn't as readily available or in which good nutrition is also lacking. And Jesus, may we not be so selfish as to celebrate our freedom without carrying on our hearts those who are not yet there. So we pray that you would give us a, a worldview that seeks the best for all. Lord, as we go through this next week, we lean deeper into you, so thankful to be transformed by your gracious, wonderful love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Like Jacob, we take one step at a time. Let's sing one more step along the road I go. Let's respond with our hearts.
receive a blessing from your God. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. May the grace of God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.